The story of Netflix is big and fascinating, full of world-changing ideas and fortunes gained and lost. It would all make for a great limited series one day, maybe on Netflix itself. Until then, here are some little-known facts about what really goes on behind that familiar red logo. The inspiration for Netflix is a tale often told, and it's a very entertaining and relatable one, pointing out perfectly the flaws of the video industry which Netflix aimed to fix. The story goes that Netflix co-founder Reed Hastings was inspired to start the business after returning a copy of Apollo 13 to a blockbuster video way past its due date and getting hit with $40 in late fees. Stung by the charges, he vowed to find a way to get DVDs to customers without charging late fees. Thus, the Netflix model was born. Movie fans paid a monthly fee to have a certain number of DVDs at home, which they could keep for as long as they liked or return them in exchange for a new movie. As great as the story is at putting a neat little bow on the founding of the company, it's completely made up, something that Netflix co-founder Mark Randolph has called, quote, a convenient fiction. The actual story behind Netflix's creation is simple. Randolph and Hastings sat down to brainstorm ideas for a new company and kept going until they landed on one that worked. We're not just doing this for money. We're doing it for a load of money. It's on most every list of bad business decisions. Blockbuster Video turned down the chance to buy Netflix. In 2000, the fledgling home video upstart offered itself up to the then industry leader Blockbuster for $50 million, and Blockbuster execs said no thank you. The company instead went all in on a broadband based entertainment delivery service with Enron, subject to one of the most scandalous and disastrous corporate collapses in history barely more than a year later. Netflix, meanwhile, grew to generate billions and dominate on-demand home entertainment, while Blockbuster no longer exists. Uh, there's a lot more to the story. When Netflix put itself up for sale, it was hemorrhaging money and wasn't nearly worth its asking price. Nor did it want an outright Blockbuster takeover, suggesting instead that it run Blockbuster's online storefront. Basically, Netflix swaggered up to a massive company and asked for $50 million and exclusive use of its brand. It makes sense that Blockbuster executives rejected the idea. As you'd expect for a company with thousands of films in its archives, Netflix meticulously catalogs every movie in its library. But the company goes much deeper than sorting by genre, rating, year of release, or cast and crew, though. Netflix takes everything into account when it adds a new film or TV show to its library. And we mean everything. Netflix's proprietary algorithm sorts films based on everything from historical settings to whether or not it contains vampires, allowing them to cater to almost ludicrously specific tastes. As an example of how laser-like the focus of Netflix's genre algorithm is, for an April Fool's joke, they once suggested users check out movies featuring an epic Nick Cage meltdown, which may as well have just been a list of every Nick Cage film, but you get the idea. <laughs> In 2014, a curious statistician worked through the code of Netflix and found the site has more than 75,000 different micro-genres that it uses to categorize movies and shows. For example, 8008 leads to steamy sci-fi and fantasy, while 45028 means deep-sea horror movies. Netflix isn't completely forthright about the existence of the codes, but they're easily and directly accessible when using Netflix with a web browser. Type in netflix.com slash browse slash genre slash into the navigation bar and then type in a random three, four, or five-digit number and just see what happens. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S! What's the most important thing Netflix owns? Exclusive rights to stream numerous blockbuster movies? A cut of the merchandising for Stranger Things? Nope, it's the data of its massive subscriber base, which those same viewers generate every time they watch something on Netflix. Along with collecting basic data from subscribers, like the shows they watch at what time and for how long, Netflix pinpoints when you pause, rewind, or stop watching something in an attempt to figure out why. This data on its own isn't all that useful, but when cross-referenced with basic geographical information and the same data produced by the other 70 million odd Netflix subscribers, it can be used to produce comprehensive charts detailing exactly what people watch. Netflix sadly keeps this information to itself, so we'll never know how far the average person gets into the typical Adam Sandler movie before they give up and shut the thing off. <laughs> Along with helping Netflix decide what to purge from its library, the data is an invaluable tool for Netflix when it produces original content, allowing the service to confidently predict exactly how many people will watch a particular original program and set an appropriate budget. So remember, the next time you press pause, you're holding the fate of your favorite streaming stars in your hands. 
Because Netflix isn't beholden to advertisers and has a largely guaranteed revenue stream from subscribers, the company will often order two seasons of any show it produces rather than a pilot. Actors and writers have credited this with giving them a greater degree of flexibility when creating shows as they don't have to rely on gimmicks like cliffhangers to retain viewers. Instead, they can focus on simply creating good content. This is one of the reasons some episodes of original Netflix shows are different lengths. The writers aren't restricted to the usual time constraints of regular TV, so they can make an episode as long or short as it needs to be. Also, because of the vast wealth of statistics about viewing habits Netflix has at its fingertips, the company abstains from micromanaging shows because it knows they will succeed. The best example of this is probably House of Cards. Netflix had no qualms about giving director David Fincher approximately $4 million per episode because they had data showing that users loved the original British series. On top of that, the stats showed audiences were big fans of Fincher and Kevin Spacey and rated their work highly. As a result, Netflix pretty much knew the show would be a hit before it even aired because the data indicated that it would. One heartbeat away from the presidency, not a single vote cast in my name. Democracy is so overrated. Netflix is surprisingly hands-off when it comes to the management of its employees, which is pretty unusual for a massively successful, omnipresent media company worth billions of dollars. In fact, full-time workers in Netflix's main office are basically allowed to set their own hours, with company policy stating that an individual employee can take off as many days as they feel they need. The policy is so lax that if you want to take off more than 30 days in a row, all you need is the okay from a manager. The reasoning behind this, from Netflix's point of view anyway, is that if you hire good employees and treat them like adults, they can be trusted to make good decisions. This ethos is best summed up by Netflix's official expense policy, which goes, act in Netflix's best interests. Employees can pretty much request expenses for anything they like, but they're asked to spend the money like it's their own. Despite seeming like such a system would be massively open to abuse, hello, 30 new laptops, it works and functions with little actual oversight, with executives noting that the only real people they have to keep an eye on are the IT guys because they always request fancy gadgets and toys for their office. In addition to tracking what shows its customers watch and how often they pause them, Netflix also employs analysts who track exactly what the world's most stingy entertainment enthusiasts are torrenting online. Like the data it collects from subscribers, piracy figures represent an invaluable insight into viewing habits that Netflix uses to adjust its own programming. After all, if people are willing to give their computer an STD to watch Game of Thrones or Arrow, it probably means someone is willing to pay a few dollars to watch a similar show from the comfort of their toilet. Netflix has even been reported to use the geographical data of pirates to adjust its pricing, lowering the cost of their service in areas with high rates of piracy in an attempt to lure pirates over to the SS Netflix and chill. It's a sentiment that kind of reminds us of this famous quote by video game developer Gabe Newell. The best way to combat piracy is by offering consumers better service than they might get from the pirates. Plenty of online companies found success in spite of a name that's made up, nonsensical, or derived from an obscure word in a language other than English. Etsy and Hulu weren't exactly familiar words 15 years ago. But Netflix? That just makes sense. It employs the power of the internet, or net, to watch flicks. Simple. It took company founders a while to put that portmanteau together. Before deciding on Netflix, names like Replay, Direct Picks, Cinema Center, Now Showing, Eflix, and Kibble were all under various levels of consideration. A company's public perception comes from more than just its name, though. Plenty of businesses make an impression with an advertising jingle, and Netflix kinda has one of those. We're talking, of course, about the most famous two-note sequence since the Law & Order scene change sound. That distinctive noise is widely assumed to be derived from the very last scene of the last episode of the second season of House of Cards, one of the very first Netflix original shows. It happens when the conniving Frank Underwood triumphantly slams his fist down on his desk, twice in rapid succession. In late 2011, Netflix's entry into streaming was so successful that it looked to permanently overshadow what had previously been the company's core business, DVD rentals by mail. So in a blog post in September 2011, CEO Reed Hastings revealed that Netflix would split apart. Netflix would be the home for online streaming, while the DVD by post service would be spun off into a new and completely separate service called Quickster. Some financial analysts speculated that making the DVD business a separate entity was Netflix's attempt to sell off that division, allowing it to focus its efforts and resources on the growth industry of streaming. But nobody stepped in to buy Quickster, and after three days of nasty public backlash, the company reversed course and kept its DVD business under the Netflix umbrella. 
Netflix customers can stream a little or a lot of everything, and since not every movie and TV show is excellent, the service certainly has its share of stinkers. It also produces more original content than any person with a life could keep up with. In other words, it doesn't seem like Netflix ever rejects any content offered up by producers or distributors, but even the world's largest virtual video store says no sometimes. For one example, Sony was reportedly so dismayed by low audience test scores for the 2018 Will Ferrell comedy Holmes & Watson, which went on to win the Razzie Award for Worst Picture of the Year, that it offered it to Netflix as a straight-to-digital release, and Netflix turned it down. But Netflix also passed on three of the most acclaimed and original TV series of the 2010s, all of which went on to win awards for other carriers. According to Netflix Chief Content Officer Ted Sarandos, his company let Amazon Video have Transparent, Hulu have The Handmaid's Tale, and USA land Mr. Robot. But as Sarandos told Variety, quote, A lot of times, it's not the reflection of the show, it's just timing. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos are coming soon! Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one!